Hello and welcome back to the Dragonfly Daily. As always, I am your host, Mike Marsh, the product manager of Dragonfly. So I'm glad you're back for us. We're going to continue this daily source of fresh content on tackling the challenges of scientific imaging. So we are back. If you are new to this lesson, you can follow me at Dragonfly Wizard on Twitter, and you can also connect with me on LinkedIn or find more information and connect with me on ResearchGate. And all of our videos are archived and available on YouTube, usually within one day, maybe an exception for lesson 15, but generally all those lessons are available within one day. If you are watching this on YouTube, YouTube, hit that subscribe button, turn it from red to gray. We want to know that we have subscribed users that are interested in content like this. Also, I want a like button. I, I want you to hit that like. I need lots of likes to know that people are interested in the deep learning category or else we'll move on and, and focus on other, other topics. Now, we are covering in lessons 15 through 19. We're covering deep less, deep learning. So we, yesterday, we gave an introduction of deep learning for imaging scientists. Today, we are going to talk about denoising. We're talking about how you can use deep learning methods to apply denoising techniques for your scientific images. Then in lessons later this week, we will look at image segmentation, super resolution, and some other advanced topics, maybe like particle detection and transfer learning. We'll see. Now, this is lesson 16, denoising with deep learning. For this, we will be using Dragonfly 4.1. I should mention, up until now, all of the lessons have used Dragonfly 4.1, but none of them have used the deep learning module. That means if you meet the minimum system requirements for Dragonfly, which include an OpenGL 4.3 graphics card, you have been able to keep up with all of the previous lessons. Today's lesson starts using deep learning. Deep learning does have an extra system requirement. That is, you must have a CUDA-capable NVIDIA graphics card that can do, keep up with and do the computations for the deep learning training and inference. So if you don't have one of those graphic cards, you won't be able to open the deep learning tool that we're going to use today. Now, uh, in that discussion of hardware, in lessons one through 14, Mike, that is me, has been using my laptop. So Mike's laptop is a Windows 10 laptop with, uh, and this was purchased in 2015. It's got 16 gigabytes of RAM and a mobile graphics chipset with six gigabytes of uh, video memory. This is to show you this uh, modest laptop has been capable of doing most of what we want to do in Dragonfly. This laptop can also de do deep learning, but it's slower than my desktop. Now my desktop or my workstation, this is a Windows 10 system. It's got a much higher performance uh, CPU. It's got a 32 core CPU. It's got 64 gigabytes of RAM, and it has what was the, the flagship uh, GeForce card. I should say flagship. I guess they're titanium and they're Titan or they're, G or they're flagships, but this was a high performance graphics card uh, in the 2017 2018 timeline. And so this system was purchased for about $3,500 in 2018. So the system I'm working on today is still running Windows, but we're on an environment that has higher performance, so we can do a little bit better with the deep learning training and inference. Um, and I will probably continue to use this workstation for some future lessons, but we'll see. So we are going to talk about denoising. What we will look at today is we'll look at how to construct a neural network model that we can use. We're going to focus on the training pattern. The pattern is I need inputs that I can pair with outputs. Then the whole objective is the, of the deep learning solution is for the, the fitting routine to learn this transformation, to learn how to transform input images into output images. And in the case of today, it's transforming noisy images into low noise images. Now we're going to look at, we're going to discuss at least three different ways of setting up a neural network model for doing denoising. Now the intuitive Intuitive is to pair a high noise image with a low noise image. Now, experimentally, if you have a light microscope or an X-ray uh, microscope or an electron microscope, it really doesn't matter. If you are capable of capturing a short duration image, you would expect it to be high noise. If you can capture the exact same field of view, the exact same frame with a longer exposure, you would expect that to be low noise. That is the experimental solution for getting the training data you want to train for a denoising model. So if you can pair a high noise image with a low noise image, then you have what you need to set up and train models. That's the empirical way of creating the data. And I like to say that this pattern of pairing inputs with outputs is pairing cheap images with expensive images. The whole idea is these low noise images, sure, I could have collect them experimentally, but that means my exposure times are 10 or 20 or 30 times longer, and I don't want to do that. If I want to uh, obtain cheap images, but they have high noise, and I want to convert them into expensive images. So that's the pattern we'll follow, is pairing cheap images with expensive images. So the first and most intuitive model we'll look at is comparing a high noise image with a low noise image. Then there's this unexpected model of pairing a high noise image with a high noise image. This is called the autoencoder, and we'll look at this. This um, from the first level intuition, if you haven't really thought about how deep learning models work, you wouldn't expect this to do anything at all for you, but we're going to see it make some difference. And then the third model we'll discuss, I don't know if we have time to show it because it takes a while to train and it may not actually work on the training data that I have loaded, but the third model is called noise to noise. And this is where you take your source image and you add noise to it 
And then you take another uh, copy of the source image and you add another version of noise to it. And then you try and train the model to convert a noisy image into another noisy image. So yeah, that sounds crazy. Um, this is a really a great way of solving the problem of denoising when you don't have an empirical way of collecting data. You can actually do this in in digitally, you can uh, make noise on the image. So this is called noise to noise and it's described in the literature. So for all of these mechanisms, there really is an empirical way of getting low noise images and a synthetic way, uh, or I should say empirical way of getting, yeah, of low noise image or a synthetic way. So the, the empirical way of course would be to a capture or capture or acquire an image with longer exposure time. The digital way or the synthetic way would be to run a denoising filter. Of course, if you have a denoising filter, that maybe begs the question of why do you even need the deep learning? But it actually turns out to be quite nice because the deep learning will go faster than the human programmed algorithms for denoising. So this, that's the empirical way of getting a low noise image here. Um, you don't actually need a low noise image for this way and you don't need a low noise image for this way, but you can synthesize this uh, noise addition just by using a digital processing algorithm that adds noise to your image. The final thing I want to say is that the models that you train, the deep learning models, the neural network models that you train uh, on in Dragonfly, they are transferable. So you can, if you know where to look, you can grab that folder for that model and you can share it with another user and they can drop it in their Dragonfly installation. Or you can just post directly to the Infinite Toolbox, which is kind of like an app store for Dragonfly. So you can take a trained model, upload it to the Infinite Toolbox, and then other people can search for it and find it and download it. The Infinite Toolbox also supports versioning, so you can take after you've trained it maybe with one data set, if uh, a year later you have much more data and you have a revised version of the model that's even better, you can upload that updated version. Okay, now we're going to switch over to Dragonfly 4.1. I'm going to double click to go full screen in this quadrant. The data set we're looking at is, the, is this uh, SEM, or I think it might be a three view data set. Um, this is an, a multi-slice data set of HeLa cells acquired on a Zeiss Gemini sim. So these data come courtesy of uh, Dr. Xu Jun Sun at University of Alberta Cross Cancer Institute. So this is what we looked at uh, a little bit yesterday and also I think in one of the videos that we posted on Twitter refers to this data set. Now, this data set, if you were to zoom in and look at it, I'm using a middle mouse drag to zoom, you can see the pixels are taller than they are wide. If I were to right click on the image data set and go to data set properties, you can see that it's five nanometer pixels in the X and Y and 50 nanometers in the Z. So that means that there, these are these uh, oblong or non-isometric uh, voxels. If I come over here, I can zoom in. If I zoom in on the X and Y, you can see the pixels are uh, isotropic in X and Y, or I should maybe should say isometric in X and Y, but non-isometric in Z. So that's not going to affect us today. Um, you will note that when we're applying these deep learning models, we are applying them to X, Y slices, at least until Dragonfly 2020.1, where, where we can apply in 3D. Now, if you look at this image, it's quite noisy. And so we want to understand and experiment, how can we use deep learning to denoise images like this? Now, the very first thing I mentioned in our scenario is you could take a high noise image and try and train it against a low noise image. Now I have a low noise image loaded. So here is the same image after it's been run through an image filter and I can scroll through and see different images. Now it maintains a lot of contrast and a lot of features. In some cases, features are a little washed out and that's kind of what happens when you do smoothing. But in many cases you have very strong features and at much better, uh, much better, I will say contrast to noise ratio than the source image. So I'm just turning uh, the visibility on and off. If you wanted to look at these images side by side, you could come over to the main panel, choose a layout that gives you two scenes. The thing is, we haven't done this before, but the thing is scenes have visibility and the visibility of an image is uh, is modulated on a scene level. I don't want to get too deep into that, but on the left, I have the scene I've been working on. On the right, I have another scene. I'm going to double click in its XY view. On the scene on the left, I have my unfiltered image. On the scene on the right, I'm going to turn on my denoised image. So now I can see them side by side. If I come over on the left and I find the scene views synchronizer, I can select the left view if that's the view I want to drive and select zoom position and window leveling. Now when I zoom, I can see the side by side. So you saw this pattern in the image processing toolbox, but now we're doing it just in the regular Dragonfly main context. And so I can scroll through and I can zoom and I can pan and I can even change the brightness and contrast. Uh-oh. Uh, do, do, do. No. Hmm. 
Uh, it does not appear to be changing the brightness and contrast. Either that's a bug or I'm forgetting something. Well, fortunately, we don't need that right now. I'll just turn it off since we're not even using it. But I can do a, a zoom and a pan, and I can compare these images. So since I have a, an image on the left that is uh, noisy or has high noise and an image on the right that has low noise, I could use this as my data set for training and making a deep learning model. Now, what I will do right now is I don't want to run a training on all 120 slices because that would be very expensive and take a lot of compute time. And I don't need that much training data. So instead, I'm going to show you something else you haven't seen yet in Dragonfly. I'm going to mark select slices of this data set and I'm going to extract those slices and use that sub volume. I don't know if you want to call it sub volume, but they use those select slices. Let me show you what I mean. So I don't need this uh, two view layout anymore. I'm going to switch back to a single view layout. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure I am in something called the image plane. I'm going to right click and choose image plane and then I'm going to select unfiltered. Now, in the image, I'm going to right click and, and choose show marked slices indicator. Now, at the very bottom of the view, you'll see a checkbox. I'm going to click the reset button, and that's just going to put me on the middle slice. So, I'm on slice 61. I'm going to check this box. Now, I come over here on the unfiltered, and I right click, and I say, new data set from marked slices. Now, I have unfiltered marked slices. I'm just going to rename this unfiltered one slice. I can also take my image and I can uh, scroll down. I can scroll down to slice one and whoops and click the checkbox. Oop, I do need to have an image selected and click the checkbox. And now I can grab the slice, the uh, number, drag all the way up to slice 120. Once again, click the checkbox. Now, when I right click and do new data set from Mark Slices, now I have unfiltered and it is three slices unfiltered. Three slices. If you look at the information, if I click here, you'll see that this has depth three, this image has depth one, and I didn't notice, I did not note the image size, but you can see that the images are, for example, 4,000 by 4,000 pixels. Um, is there an interruption with the audio? No, no. Oh, speech and video are badly out of sync. Well, let's just stop the video. There we are. Okay, now we'll resume. <clears throat> so what we have here, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what we have here is we've extracted one slice and we've extracted three slices. Now, what I what else I can do is I could do the same thing on the denoised image. So if I uh, scroll all the way down to slice one, click the checkbox. Scroll all the way up to slice one twenty, click the checkbox. So I'm marking slices in the denoised image. We don't see it there. Now we see it. Select it, and uh, I can right click and say set slice and go back to slice sixty one and hit apply, and I can mark this slice. Now I can take this, I can right click, and I can say new data set from marked slices, and we will double click and we will type denoised three slices. Very good. Now, um, what we have over here is we have uh, the full data set, but we also have extracted slices. And so we can use these extracted slices as our pair. So we can pair those data for deep learning training. Now we can get started on the deep learning training. I'm going to go over to tools and I'm going to choose deep learning tool. This will open up. If you don't have the NVIDIA graphics card that meets the requirements, you won't be able to open this. Now in this environment, we're not going to look at all the details today, but the, what I do want to call your attention to, this is a list of models available on your system. These are models that have already been, uh, these are models that already exist. Now, if you're launching deep learning for the first time, you may not see any models here at all. You can get started with a new model either by downloading a model from the toolbox. Uh, the movement and the cursor is out of sync. Um, well, I don't know why, why Zoom is failing us, uh, but we'll hopefully the audio will be good enough. So, you can get started either by downloading models directly from the infinite toolbox, or you can get started by clicking the new button. When you click the new button, it allows you to create a new deep learning model. This will be a new model with randomized weights that won't have it have undergone any training at the point when you create it. Now you will see a number of architectures available here. We're just going to use UNET today. This list is larger in Dragonfly 2020.1, and you also have the capability of setting uh, multi-slice models. But in Dragonfly 4.1, you're limited to just single slice models.
Now, for today, we will not be training segmentation. We will not be training binary or multi-label segmentation. We'll be training denoising models, which we consider regression models. So these will be models that are going to take grayscale images as output, as input, and return grayscale images as output. Now, if I wanted to create a denoising model, so I could call this lesson 16 denoising A. And what I could do is I just want to say I want a unit. I can leave these parameters as default and I just click generate. This is going to create a unit that's only going to take one input channel as input and and as opposed to having multiple input channels like you know secondary electron and backscatter or red, green, and blue for a color image. Instead, we'll just have a single input image channel. It has a name, it has a model type. I'll click generate. This will create a new model and it will add it to our list of models. Okay, the model generated successfully, I'll hit close. So now I have this one, it's, it's marked unit lesson 16 denoising A. With that model selected, now you do have information down below, but we're not gonna get into this. This is for the 1% users that actually know how to tune and adjust their neural network model. You can zoom in, you can change all of the parameters, you can change the activation function, you can change the connectivity, you can add and delete layers, and that's all on the editing tab, but that's all for a very advanced lesson. Instead, we've just created this model, we're gonna click the go to training. This is where we would set up training. Now, what we have are we have inputs and training parameters. So on the inputs, we're just gonna do a couple of things. For input, let's start with the unfiltered three slices as input, and let's choose the filtered uh, denoised slices as output. Now, this denoised, these images are not, they do not come from an empirical imaging experiment. These are just uh, images that I filtered using Dragonfly or Dragonfly Pro filters. In this case, it was filtered by some non-local means filter and some mean shift filter. So this is an example of where you could create the target function uh, digitally, or you can make a synthetic low noise image just by applying denoising filters. So it, it's up to you whether you're going to create the, the target output either empirically with an experimental observation in the microscope or you're going to do it digitally by running filters in something like Dragonfly. We're not going to use the mask function today. We will revisit that tomorrow. So we, we've paired our input and our output. Under data augmentation, uh, we could leave it turned on or we could leave it turned off. Uh, we'll, we'll visit that more tomorrow. So I'm going to deselect data augmentation and now I'm going to go to the training parameters. So just as a recap on the inputs, all I did was set the input and output. Now under training parameters, we have to set the parameters for doing this training. In this case, the image is very noisy and it has a very large, uh, it's very high resolution. I'm going to explain what I mean in a few minutes. I'm going to change the patch size to 128. And we're going to uh, dive into the details of these parameters much more tomorrow. I'm just going to leave everything else uh, where it is, and I'm going to hit train. Now, what this is going to do when I hit train is it's going to set up the neural network model and initiate the training. It's going to take those three slices, and it's going to break them into patches. Then it's going to present the neural network model an input patch, and it's going to get an output as a result of the neural network model, and then it's going to compare the output with the target output. And then it's going to look at that loss function, and then it's going to tune the network to try and minimize the loss function. It's going to do that iteratively over all of the patches in the training data set and after it's done that with every single patch in the data set once that is the end of what we call epoch one after that's done it will repeat so it will use the exact same training set in a second epoch so it turns out the neural network models learn from repetitive or benefit from repetitive learning and so they can benefit from multiple epochs now you can see here that the result of the first epoch has some information it's telling us the loss function and the mean squared error function um, both from the input data, but also the validation data. One thing I did not mention is when you're training a model, unless you set the parameters otherwise, Dragonfly will take all of the patches that can be used for training and it will set aside 20% for validation. Those 20% are not presented in the training phase. So when you're going through the training, it presents all of the, the first 80% of the patches and those are used to update the weights of the network. Then in the validation phase of each epoch, it presents the set aside 20% data and evaluates the loss function on those. Now those were not used for the training, so it's using a special set aside to evaluate the performance of the network. So you can monitor the loss function of the whole data set and then you, and then you can, or the first 80%, and then you can modify the loss function and the mean squared error of the set aside validation. So you can see, and what you hope to see is the loss function should be falling in each epoch. Now, this begs the question, how many epochs do I need? And those are, how much training data do I need? How many cycles or epochs of training do I need? Those are very hard questions to answer. So um, 
hopefully some of our users or even some of my colleagues will do some experiments to try and uh, uh, encourage and generate some rules. But the, the, the bottom line for now, the best guidance I can give you is you will get more, you will get better results with more training unless you notice that the loss function is no longer falling and you will get better results with a more diverse training set. So the more training data, the better, the more, uh, the more epochs, the better, but you can monitor it. So you can see the loss function uh, falling and you can monitor it. Now I have this data. I did this exact same experiment last night and I ran it for about 12 epochs. What I'll do right now is I'll hit stop and we can maybe compare the results of this, you know, three minutes of training with my 10 minutes of training from last night, if you like. Now what I can do is in my uh, environment here, I'm looking at an image, but if I say I want to look at the unfiltered image and I can look at any slice, actually, these are the three training slices. Let's look at the data that comes from, uh, comes from outside the training scope. So these are pixels that were not even part of the training data set. What I can do is I can take this model that's been trained and I can ask it to apply a preview on this image, the unfiltered image stack. So if I hit apply, it's going to take this model and it's gonna uh, try and do a preview on just this one slice, slice 99, and just the area that we're looking at in the field of view. So you can see the results of that preview. So that's the result of training a model for whatever, three or four minutes for five epochs. Now I could uh, also, if I were outside the Dragonfly, outside of the deep learning interface, we could uh, run the other uh, model that I've already trained. So what we see here is we see a, a very big improvement just from a little bit of training and it had a, had a lot of training data. But as I mentioned, you can monitor the loss function and if the loss function continues to fall, you can use more cycles of training data. All right, now that was demonstrating the first scenario of what we call, uh, well, I don't even know, have a name for it, but where you pair a high noise image with a low noise image. Now, there is also the idea of pairing a high noise image with a high noise image. Now, this is not gonna be useful practically speaking, but it is uh, educational to consider what's happening. So we're gonna do it not to give you guidance on what you should be doing with your denoising, but just to give you some introduction to something that's important, I think, to understand in how these deep learning uh, network models uh, are capable of doing things. So let me show you what I mean. First, I'm gonna click save to save this model. This is my unit lesson 16 denoising A. Now I'll go back to the model overview by clicking the button here. Now I have something called an auto encoder and I'm gonna do it with you rather than using the one I trained last night. I'm gonna click new and I'm going to ask for a unit. Regressions can be exactly the same thing, but we're gonna call this uh, lesson 16 auto encoder and we'll click generate. All right, let's let it generate and done. Now I'm gonna choose this auto encoder. I'm gonna to go to training. And in this case, I'm going to set it up that single slice, the unfiltered slice. I'm gonna use that as my input and as my output. And I'm uh, uh, again gonna use a larger patch size of 128. And I will call, uh, draw your attention. There is a certain amount of memory required to do the training and your graphics card only has a certain amount of memory. So you will note that when you change the patch size and the batch size and other parameters affected a little bit, you will note it's going to update how much memory it's gonna use. So if I reset my batch size to like 128, it immediately says you're exceeding the memory available on your graphics card. So you can take note of that. So we'll talk hopefully about batch size tomorrow. Now I've set this up, I'm going to click train. This is going to do a, uh, well, let me, uh, let me start the training and then let me uh, switch over to my notes so you understand uh, what this is doing. So this is taking a high noise image and it's training it against a high noise image. Now what's happening here is the neural network is given one input and it's given the same thing as the output. And so you might expect that the model will just take whatever inputs and just return the outputs. But the structure of this neural network model, it uses some parameters, uh, something called max pooling, and it uses parameters that do downsampling and then upsampling. And the bottom line is the architecture of this network is not good at reproducing noise. It's kind of like using a compression algorithm and a decompression algorithm in all in one. And so by training it to re return the same output as the input, it learns, but it's not good at learning how to reproduce noise. So this model that we're running right now, it will actually um, do some denoising 
even though we didn't give it that as instruction. So the takeaway there is the neural network model architectures, most of them, maybe even all of them, I'd have to think about it, are not good at learning how to reproduce noise. And so as unexpected as it is, this works as a denoising model. Not a very good denoising model, not nearly as good as this first model. Now, the last one I mentioned, are you crazy? So you can take your source image and you can add noise to it. Let's call that image A. Then you can take your source image, add noise to it again, but a different version of noise. Um, so the same parameters, but, but random noise and call this image B. And then you can train a model to go from A to B. As we just mentioned, the neural network model is not good at learning to reproduce noise, but the signal that is common in underlying in both A and B is extracted and the neural network learns how to do denoising. So this is a very popular method. It's called noise to noise and it's described in the literature. Um, I wish I had the paper here so I could uh, refer you to it now. Okay, so these are the three different uh, mechanisms. Uh, uh, there, there are multiple mechanisms. There's something newer in the literature that's replaced noise to noise called noise to void. I think one of my colleagues will implement that uh, in May and put it in the toolbox. So there are different mechanisms. There's always something happening in the literature. But this gives you an idea of how you can use Dragonfly to pair input images with output images, and that is uh, pair the cheap images with the expensive images so the neural network model can learn a transform and try and cheat and, and turn your cheap images into expensive images. Now, that's all we're going to look at today. I will take some questions, and then towards the end of the questions, I will switch back uh, to Dragonfly so we can see the results of the autoencoder. Well, it's already run 15 epochs. Uh, we can go ahead and look at it now. I mean, it's, it's not a good filter, but you're going to see that it has done uh, some filtering. Now, um, I'm back in the Dragonfly environment, and it's still training. I do want to make a note here. Training is cumulative. So if I hit stop now, it will have trained for 17 epochs. If I then tell it to start again, and it trains for epoch one, epoch two, those are really epochs 18, 19, 20. So unless you reset the neural network model, whenever you hit again, hit train again, it will do a cumulative training. So 18, 19 epochs, whatever, let's hit stop. So uh, we see the mean error has gone down, but it's not going down as fast anymore. So I'll click OK. Now, if I come over here and I uh, select my unfiltered image and I scroll through and I try and run this filter on that and I ask to apply. This is the apply button, but it's really just applying a preview on the current slice. So we'll look at this. Not going to be a very good filter, but you're going to see it does apply some filtering. Okay. So what you can see here, let's... Uh, let me go back to that slice. You can see the, uh, sorry, my mouse wheel is accidentally changing slice. You can see the noisy nature in the source image and how that noise is not reproduced so strongly in the output image. So it's not as denoisy as the other solutions, um, but it, it's surprising that, uh, or it might be surprising or unintuitive that it gives you denoising at all. But like I said, that's because of the architecture of the neural network model. All right, um, now I should have done this at the top of the hour. I do wanna make a quick announcement. The uh, lessons next week, we will have an interruption on Thursday and Friday lessons. We're not gonna have a Dragonfly daily next Thursday and Friday, April 30th and May 1st. We do encourage you to register online for this image processing techniques workshop hosted by CCEM. So you can find this workshop information online. We will be giving uh, one lecture on, uh, this may sound unintuitive, but it's gonna be a very interesting lecture. Image processing is not what you want to do toward automatic image analysis. That'll be the Thursday lecture. And then the Friday lecture will be the Dragonfly Segmentation Wizard. So this is going to show you the new way of doing deep learning in Dragonfly with the 2020.1 release, which uses the Segmentation Wizard, which makes it a lot faster and easier to get your segmentation training data. And uh, you can go and visit their uh, information online to uh, register for this workshop. So register and then you can watch these. These are all uh, virtual. So uh, with that said, let's... Uh, uh, I don't have a slide that says questions and answers, do I? So, uh, nope. So let's go ahead and uh, switch over. We'll keep this in the foreground and we'll pull up the questions and answers. All right. Thank you for your patience. Now let's see. Oh, I'll click save on the model. Let's see uh, what questions we have. All right. Annika asks, what filter did you use to create the low noise image or is the noise artificial? The noise is not artificial. This is a real SEM micrograph collected on a real uh, SEM microscope. The denoised image was created. So this is just, you know, 
if you want to go fast and you want lots of images, then they're going to be noisy. And so these images are 4,000 by 4,000 that are 120 slices. And so this data set, rather than taking a super long time, you're able to go faster, but of course the images are noisy. So I ended up using a three filter sequence. Um, I don't have it documented here, but it's, I think it's a mean shift, then a non-local means followed by a mean shift. All right, the next question is, uh, uh, okay, uh, she's not having a problem with audio video. Is there a list of the literature of those algorithms that uh, the Dragonfly is built on? Uh, well, I guess it depends on which algorithms you're talking about. So if you find things in Dragonfly and you want to know what they're based on, uh, you can email support. Maybe we can make it a policy that whenever someone emails support, we take it as an action to update the online documentation so that people can find it when they're looking online uh, at our documentation. So a lot of the algorithms are using open source implementations that are uh, royalty free for us to use. Sometimes we implement our own. Um, next question, with denoising, is there a risk of over interpreting the data? In other words, is there any reason that someone can accuse you of tampering too much with the original data where you see something that doesn't actually exist? or are uncertainties manifested as blurs in the image? Well, yeah, that's a great question. And there's any time you're massaging or processing the data, you can be accused of tampering the data. What you would like to do is use a method that is unbiased and uh, is gonna give the same results in everyone's hands and try and be able to justify it. And so if you're using methods that are described in the literature and have, have, have been used you know, by others for a long time or stood the test of peer review, you're probably on safer ground. That's a really difficult question to, to unpack and discuss. So I'm not sure I can get into the details. I haven't really thought too much about it or it's a little hard for me to answer on the fly. But uh, anytime you're doing image processing, that is a risk you run. But also if you don't do the image processing, you won't be able to do the segmentation. So in fact, all of what we do tomorrow will be, have the same problem is if you segment the mitochondrion by eye, can you believe it? Or is it biased by the operator? So you could say the same thing when you apply image filtering. Have you applied filters to enhance features that aren't really there? So um, I can't really get into that too deeply. It'd be a good uh, forum, a good discussion for people to discuss in an, in an open format. Um, all right, so next question. Uh, next question, will, you know, that one's already been answered. Okay, uh, Sydney raises another point. To make it clear, we had a training micro CT data set trained with a few layers and applied UNET successfully for segmentation. We had a second data set with quite different brightness and contrast, so the segmentation did not work well. By using Fiji and ImageJ histogram specification, we used a good layer of the training data set to correct all the layers of the second data set. Then the segmentation worked very well. So I think I understand. I think that's that's what I was trying to say. I may have misspoke or not done a good job, but yes, if the data set have very different brightness and contrast and you are able to normalize that data so it looks like the data from your training, then you'll be well off and you can expect the model to succeed. Or you could provide a more diverse training set that has data from different brightness and contrast that reflect the experimental imaging conditions you're likely to encounter. Okay. Um, a lot of people having problems with the video earlier, so we've dismissed the video. All right, if we pair experimental high noise and low noise images, how important is it to geometrically align those two images? It's absolutely critical. So if you train a model to go from a, a high noise to a low noise and there is a displacement, like the, pixel, the images are two and a half pixels off, the neural network is capable of learning that and you would end up uh, teaching a neural network model to uh, apply a two pixel translation to all of your input images. So what I would do is I would set the stage, wait for the stage to stabilize, then take a high noise image and take a low noise image. If you're doing CT reconstruction, then you need to do a, uh, you could either do it in the projection domain or you could do it in the reconstruction domain. In the, in the projection domain, it's very easy. In the reconstruction domain, you would need to collect an entire low signal to noise data set and another high signal to noise data set, reconstruct them both, make sure they're perfectly registered, and then take representative slices from both. So you do have to make that registration uh, very precise if you want this to work. Um, Sydney asks another question. In your denoising example, the validation error seemed to be smaller than the training error. Does that make sense? Well, I, I, it was probably just uh, the based on the number of, it's probably a statistical issue, probably based on the number of patches. Um, I'm, I'm going to see if my colleague, uh, if my colleague uh, Benjamin is online, he may want to take that question. Um, let's see. Uh, attendees, Benjamin. 
and there he is. I'm going to do allow to talk. I'm going to make sure I have audio. Uh, all right, Benjamin, I have unmuted your microphone. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Excellent. Um, and I think everyone else can hear Benjamin too. Uh, Benjamin, did you notice or do you have anything to say to Sydney's question? The validation error seems to be smaller than the training error. Does that make sense that the validation error would be lower or go down faster than the, the error from the training data? No, it's, uh, it, it, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure why it's happening in fact, uh, but you should have used the mean square error loss instead of the binary uh, cross entropy for a regression model. So maybe this can explain, but I'm not sure I will have ah. to take a look. Excellent. So I did not follow a best practice. So I'm glad we have Benjamin on here. So when we talked yesterday, we did talk about loss functions. And so uh, Benjamin, say that one more time. When training a denoising model, what is a good loss function to use? The mean square error loss. Okay, excellent. The mean square error loss. Um, and then uh, Benjamin, with 2020.1, if you create a new regression model, is that the default? Um, yes. Okay. Okay. So in 4.1, it's not the default. You have to change it manually. But when you start using 2020.1, the new release, it, it's on, on by default. Uh, another question. How do you input a starting seed for neural network initial value randomizer? This would be similar adding NP random seed. Well, that's a technical question, but I do have Benjamin. Benjamin, do you happen to know um, how are, are we doing the random initialization of all of the weights or are we using a TensorFlow routine? Um, and so we're binding TensorFlow code for that. We are using a TensorFlow routine. Okay, so Benjamin may not even know what the TensorFlow is. It is open source, so you can, you can look at the TensorFlow documentation and see what the method is, is, is there. So we're just using their tools for that. Next question, can we have access to the Python source code of deep learning models of Dragonfly? Well, the, uh, I'm not really sure uh, how to answer this. So the deep learning models uh, don't have Python source code. Uh, if you create a model in Dragonfly, it's already compiled as an H5 model. It's not a source code model. You can create source code models in Keras and import them directly into Dragonfly, but Dragonfly doesn't make the source code models. Uh, that, that's not what's created and stored. They're actually created as compiled models and saved. Now, the next question, in the deep learning tool, what does the estimated memory ratio mean? Um, Okay, I answered that. Very good. Um, next question. Can you view the training history of your uh, uh, convolutional neural network? That's a great question. So one of the things you can do, and I think this is uh, easier to do, well, it's, it's quite easy to do even in, in the current version of Dragonfly, is when you are on the training tab. So I'm going to select a model, I'm going to load the model, and then I'm going to go to training. So uh, this model was not in graphics card memory, so it has to be put into graphics card memory. And now it's there. And if I do go to training, one of the options you'll notice, and let's see, this is uh, Benjamin. If you're still on, I'm looking for where I can turn on TensorBoard. Is that, did that ship with Dragonfly 4.1? I think so. It's in the, uh, yes. Ah. Here we are. So um, there's a lot that we didn't show here. And so on the training parameters, you can do show advanced settings. If you turn on TensorBoard, this will actually give you a plot and you can view a plot of your loss function and your validation loss function. You can view other parameters and they're all monitored in real time on a web page and you can view them. So, and those can be saved and recorded for later. There are other parameters. You can also say, if my loss function gets lower than a certain point, then uh, terminate terminate the training or if my loss rate plateaus and the loss rate and I'm no longer, uh, my loss function is no longer falling, you can terminate. So there are a number of parameters we didn't get into today. All right. Uh, next question. Will there be an advanced tutorial to edit the architecture of the model? Well, that's a great question. I'm not sure I'm smart enough to run that tutorial. Um, there is this whole page on editing. And so um, I would love for you to either put a comment in the questions and answers right now or send me an email if you have interest in tuning the models. And that's probably for people that already use TensorFlow or already use PyTorch or Cafe or any tool. They already know what they're doing and they want to be able to click on the layer. They want to be able to change the uh, activation function. They want to be able to change... Uh, all of the parameters associated, the number of filters and a convolutional layer, et cetera. So we do not have plans on offering that tutorial right now, but if we have enough interest, we could provide that tutorial. 
Next question, how does the denoised image compare to the result of the trained a network trained on the denoise data, similar deviation, et cetera. Yeah, you know, I, I, I wish I had time to get into that more closely. So you'll actually find that the denoised model with the deep learning, not only is it faster than using the image filters, I think you will like the results better. So let me show you what I mean. So I'm gonna take, uh, I'm gonna put on three views and on the left, I'm gonna have the denoised image. And in the middle, I'm going to show the image that was denoised by deep learning. And on the right, I'm gonna show the image that was denoised by the filter. So let's do it this way. Um, all right. Um, setting it all up. Yeah. And Okay, so on the left, I have the source image. On the right, I have the one that was, uh, that was filtered. And now what I can do in the middle is I can take my uh, unfiltered image and I can, um, in Dragonfly 4.1, you will have the option of using segment with classifier. I can come over here and I can choose uh, this, uh, deno here's denoising. It's one I trained last night that uh, on 12 epochs. Now, if I hit segment, it's actually going to run this denoising filter on, in this case, uh, all three slices, and we'll compare. Um, uh, so it loads the model, it runs, um, it decomposes into patches and runs. So we'll give it another 15 seconds, and then we'll we'll look at all three side by side. Um, and looking at the next question, oh, wow, you guys have lots of questions. Okay, now um, what I'm gonna do is uh, here I'm going to visualize, uh, yeah, it's already turned on in visual. Okay, so on the left, so I'm just panning around, on the left is the source noisy image, on the right is the one smoothed by image filters, in the middle is the one smoothed by the denoising. Now, if, by the deep learning, if the deep learning were a perfect replica of the image filter, you would see exactly what you see on the right but it's not perfect and it doesn't, it, it did not, it's not a recoding of that algorithm. It's just a, a learned function based on training. Now, what I think I see is I think I see very good denoising in most places, but I also think I see better features than you actually see in the, in, I think I see better feature preservation. So there's texture in here that is lost. And I think the texture is real. Now this all begs the question of, do you have a ground truth to make an assessment? So what you would want to do is you would want to have uh, an experimental high noise and low noise image so that you could compare these properly. Um, so this gives you a little bit of a comparison. You can see that this is very, very smooth and it loses some of the texture that's present in this image. The question is, is that texture real? I mean, if you look over here, it's hard to say, is this real or, uh, or not? So again, it's better to have the empirical data so you can establish a ground truth. So, all right. Um, now, uh, next question. Uh, is the high in in the high high example? Did you turn off the noising augmentation? Yes, I did not use any data augmentation in today's lesson. I didn't, and so I did not use any uh, no, noise addition or any other um, data augmentation when I trained the the auto encoder. Uh, next question: Is there a way to know which slices we have picked up? for the input training data in order to pick the same slices of output data. Well, so we'll see this in tomorrow's lesson. We'll actually use a mask to select data. So we'll actually use a mask and we'll paint the mask and it, we'll paint the mask once and it will apply to the input data and the output data. But for today, there's no way of seeing what those slices are. Uh, I just mentally made notes to select slices one, 121, and our slices one, 61, and 121. Okay, uh, I lost my questions and answers. Oh, here they are. Now, uh, next question. Uh, so someone else asked, will lesson 15 uh, go on YouTube? So yeah, that'll come later today. Uh, less, next question. How does the trained image compare uh, to using a filter to denoise the image? So that's, uh, I think, similar to the question we just tackled. 
Okay, I still have five more questions. Let's see if we can take these or if we have time. Next question, is there a reason why I shouldn't use the Intel Open Image Denoise Neural Network or the Let's Enhance.io API Neural Network for denoising? Well, use whatever works for you. If you like those uh, frameworks and they give everything you want, then stick with it. If you wanna be able to do it all in the same software package where you do image segmentation and 3D visualization and image analysis and you like the Dragonfly tools, use Dragonfly. So today's just lesson is about how denoising neural networks work. And of course, this is the Dragonfly series so you can learn how to do it in Dragonfly. If you have another toolkit that you're happy with, then, then use it. So the next question is, and by the way, I can't comment on that toolkit directly. I've never used it, but it's, it's, uh, if it's Intel, it's probably, uh, I don't know if it's using TensorFlow or not, but if you get great results, then I wouldn't sway you away from it. Next question. I just want to say I appreciate implementing deep learning in a box since learning how to use Keras and TensorFlow without programming uh, background is very hard for sure. That's what we're trying to do is trying to trying to take what the experimentalist and the image processing experts have delivered and try and package them in a way that makes them accessible so that imaging scientists can just get results. Um, when I use TensorBoard, it gives me an empty web page. Uh, it shouldn't. So it should give you a web page that updates in real time. It works uh, on my system. If you want to uh, open up a troubleshooting ticket, we can identify the problem for you. Next question, can you put a link or more information to the SEM image event here or in the chat? So this SEM image, I do not have permission to share it. Um, I only have permission to show it, uh, but you can do this with any noisy image you, you want. So, uh, I mean, you could go out and take a picture of your face in a dark room with your smartphone and that will give you a noisy image. So uh, you can get a noisy image pretty quickly. Okay. Um, oh, and, oh. <laughs> Sorry, uh, your, I see your clarification. Can I put up a reference to the workshop event? My mistake. Let's try this. Let's copy this and put, uh, put uh, in the chat. Come on, Zoom, give me a chat window. And here we are, paste to all, there you are. Please go have a look at that PDF. Uh, it should be a great event. There's uh, lots of speakers. Some of my competitors are speaking there. Some people who've been doing image processing for decades and uh, highly established electromicroscopists are speaking. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, let's do two more questions and then we'll call it a day. Um, what if my image does have other image artifacts like beam hardening or ring artifacts? Uh, wow, did, so, did, did someone on my team pay you to ask this question? Will the neural network recognize that and automatically correct it? That's really the subject of the image processing is not what you want to do lecture on next Thursday. The idea is you don't actually have to correct artifacts if you have if you want to do segmentation and your eye can do the segmentation, that is you can visually see the features, then you don't have to correct the, the artifacts, the noise or the curtains or the uh, uh, ring artifacts or the beam hardening. Um, you can train a model and the model will learn to see right through those artifacts just like your visual cortex does. So that's really uh, the topic of, of that. So you don't have to do those, uh, those corrections. Um, but if you want to show denoised useful images in a manuscript, then you might want to clean up the images. Okay, let's do one more question. Um, can you, oh, there's only one question left. Can you only compare the deep learning de denoise result with the ground truth visually, or can you also do this numerically? Well, that's a fantastic question. Um, Benjamin, are you still on the line? Okay, yes. Benjamin. Oh. So Annika's question is, can you compare the deep learning denoised image with the ground truth numerically? So effectively this happens in the training it is showing the result of the training data as a numerical result. Um, uh, do you want to comment on that? Do you understand the question? Uh, yes. If you have a ground truth image, you can uh, do stats like PSNR or SSEM, which are matrix that compute the, um, the difference between a uh, reconstructed image and, in fact, uh, the difference be between the, the inferred image and the original image. Okay, uh, very good. And we have a plugin to do that in 2020.1. Ah, yes. So there are a few different things here. So 
you can choose the, the loss function here. When the loss function is reported, it'll be reported for your validation data, but you could set aside a completely different image to be used as validation, a completely different input and output, and that will get reported in the validation stage. Um, and as Benjamin mentioned, I think you'll find deep learning model evaluation tool. So this existed in 4.1, it's been updated, and this has a way of giving different metrics. So here are different metrics you can use, and these will give you statistical values for denoising. So this, um, and you can also use this for the segmentation. You just use a different loss function for evaluating the success of a segmentation. Okay, as always, thank you for your attention. It looks like we had a lot of good questions. A lot of people were interested. We will turn the page from denoising and move on to image segmentation for tomorrow. Um, but uh, if you have more questions, you could put comments in the YouTube channel or send email to support at theobjects.com. Thank you, everyone. Stay healthy, stay good, and uh, look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.